I will begin with a quote from Dr. Gyan Fernando. A good pathologist holds knife just like a violinist holds a bow. The significance of forensic taphonomy, various changes after death, immediate and early, estimation of postmortem interval, Elgar mortis and its medical legal importance, the postmortem staining and its medical legal importance. The forensic taphonomy is the study of history of changes of a body following death. It is basically the interdisciplinary study and interpretation of postmortem changes in human remains in dispositional context. The changes that take place are helpful in estimation of the approximate time since death. The signs of death appear in this order usually. We can divide it into three. Immediate signs uh, which occur immediately, uh, also called as somatic death. Early changes after death which occurs up to 24 hours after death that is also called as cellular death and the late changes or the decomposition changes. The immediate signs include the insensitivity and the loss of voluntary power, cessation of respiration, cessation of circulation. The early changes up to 24 hours after death, they include pallor and loss of elasticity of the skin, changes in the eye, primary flaccidity of the muscles, cooling of the body, the postmortem lividity, the rigor mortis. Whereas the late changes include the decomposition they further include the putrefaction or in the altered process the adipose ear and the mummification. So let us understand what are the, those immediate signs. Number one is insensibility and the loss of movement. It is the earliest sign of death but precautions need be taken to avoid error while confirming while certifying the death. These are found in cases of prolonged fainting attack, vagal inhibitory phenomena, epilepsy, electrocution, narcosis, all these. Then cessation of respiration. There must be complete cessation or stoppage of respiration uh, which is diagnosed by putting a stethoscope over upper portions of lungs and larynx where the faintest breath sounds can be heard. The complete stoppage of respiration for more than 5 minutes usually causes death. However, it may also occur as a purely voluntary act or during shiny strokes breathing, drowning or in the newborn infants. So we have to keep in mind. Third is the cessation of circulation. Under normal conditions, the stoppage of heartbeat for more than 5 minutes is irrecoverable and is accepted as evidence of death. Then there can be early changes up to 24 hours of death. These are changes in the skin. The skin becomes pale and white and loses the elasticity. The lips will appear as dark red to black, dry and hard due to drying. Then there occur changes in the eyes. There are several changes in the eyes. Number one, loss of corneal reflex. This is also found in all deep insensibility conditions like epilepsy, narcotic poisoning and general anesthesia. Hence, this is also not a reliable sign of death. Then there is opacity of the cornea. The opacity is due to drying and the same is delayed for about 2 hours if the lids are closed after death. If the eyelids are open for a few hours after death, a film of cell debris and mucus forms two yellow triangles on the sclera at each side of the iris with the base towards the margin of the cornea and apex towards the medial or lateral canthus of the eye which then becomes brown and then afterwards black and is called as tachinoir and this occurs within 3 to 4 hours after death. After that the dust settles and the surface becomes wrinkled so it is a kind of artifact. Then there occurs flaccidity of the eyeball. Within minutes the eyes look sunken and get softer due to reduction of intraocular tension. During lifetime, this intraocular tension varies between 14 to 25 centimeters of water. Soon after death, 
the intraocular tension is less than 12 within half an hour it is less than 3 and becomes nil at the end of 2 hours then pupils if we examine the pupils due to the relaxation of the muscles of iris the pupils are slightly dilated soon after death later with the onset of rigor mortis of the constrictor group of muscles and also due to evaporation of the fluids they may become constricted then retinal vessels there are changes in the retinal vessels in the form of fragmentation or segmentation of the blood columns in the retinal vessels and this appears within minutes after death and persists for about an hour and this is called as Kevorkian sign though it occurs all over the body due to loss of blood pressure but is best appreciated at the retina with the help of ophthalmoscope the retina is pale for the first two hours and about six hours the disc outline becomes hazy and after seven to two, ten hours it becomes blurred then there are several chemical changes inside the eyes like the potassium concentration of vitreous humor at the time of death is five to eight millimoles per liter the rise of potassium concentration per hour is 0.17 to 0.23 millimoles per hour this is mainly due to electrolyte imbalance at the time of death the variation in between the two eyes may be up to 10 percent the relationship between potassium concentration and time since death depends upon the degree and rapidity of the decomposition and the slope is usually 0.2 millimoles per liter per hour the scientist media and hans uh, they propose the formula for estimating post-mortem interval with the help of potassium concentration like multiplied 5.26 multiplied by potassium concentration minus 30.9 so this gives you an idea about time since death in hours there is a linear relationship between vitreous potassium concentration and time elapsed after death up to a period of 120 hours that means around five days this rise is mainly due to the diffusion from retina into the center of the globe the temperature the urea retention however affects this range there is a linear rise of hypoxanthin again up to five days or up to 120 hours which begins immediately after death there is correlation between vitreous hypoxanthine and potassium values the 95 percent confidence limits are plus minus 32 hours then there is chlorides they, they decrease at less than one millimole every hour and sodium by about 0.9 millimole per hour the urea exceeding 150 millimole per hour this indicates uremia as a cause of death the vitreous glucose usually falls after death and can reach zero within few hours a vitreous glucose of more than 11.1 millimole per hour indicates diabetes and less than 1.4 millimole per hour indicates hypoglycemia then coming on to the examination of postmortem interval how we deduce the postmortem interval the interval between the death and the time of examination of the dead body is known as the postmortem interval and this is important to estimate why to know when the crime is committed to allow the legal system to deal more efficiently with available information to confirm or disapprove alibi whatever is there and enable to exclude suspects or to cross check suspects statement the point to be noted while proceeding for time since death estimation are cooling of the body, the postmortem lividity, the rigor mortis, the progress of decomposition, adiposphere or mummification, entomology of the cadaver, then changes in the GIT, gastrointestinal tract. We will elaborate the other five conditions further afterwards. Let's concentrate on the gastrointestinal tract what are those changes the amount of stomach contents and the extent of their digestion may be helpful to estimate the time since death if the approximate time of the last meal taken is known the state of transport of digestion and transport of the food from the stomach to the duodenum is variable 
and depends upon several factors such as anatomical, physiological, pathological, psychological, etc. And these mainly depends upon the total quantity of food taken, additional snacks taken, ratio of solid to liquid meal, carbohydrate and fat content, marked variation between the individuals, variation in the same individual from day to day, dramatic variations due to psychogenic and endocrine factors. The stomach usually starts to empty within 10 minutes after the first mouthful have entered. The bulk of the meal leaves the stomach within 2 hours. A light meal that is a small volume usually leaves the stomach within 1 to 2 hours after being taken. A medium sized meal requires 3 to 4 hours and a heavy meal requires 5 to 8 hours. A carbohydrate meal leaves the stomach rapidly than the protein meal. Fluids and semi-fluids leave the stomach very rapidly within 2 hours after being swallowed. A head injury, mental shock, physical or emotional stress may completely inhibit the secretion of the gastric juice and motility of the stomach and undigested food may remain till 24 hours. After digestion is delayed during sleep or in coma, the head of the meal reaches the hepatic flexor in about 6 hours splenic flexor in 9 to 12 hours and pelvic colon in 12 to 18 hours. If the stomach is full containing undigested food, it can be said that death occurred within 2 to 4 hours of eating of the last meal. Then there are changes in the cerebrospinal fluid. The amount of potassium in CSF or the cerebrospinal fluid increases at a constant rate in relation to the temperature of body during the first 20 hours. So it can also be used for estimation of death. Then there are certain changes in the blood. There is progressive increase in the lactic acid levels. The value increases 50 to 75 times in 12 to 24 hours. The steepest increase occurring in first 6 to 8 hours. The amino acid nitrogen is less than 14 mg per deciliter up to 10 hours but rises to 30 mg per deciliter by 48 hours. The acid phosphatase level increases 20 times by 48 hours. The amylase levels increase 3 to 4 times on second day. The AST4 and lactate dehydrogenase increases linearly over the first 60 hours. The sodium levels fall by 0.9 milliequivalent per hour. The organic phosphorus level in serum reach 20 milliequivalent per liter 18 hours after death. So these are the changes in the blood. Then synovial fluid. There is linear rise of potassium which increases more than double within the first two days. Vitreous humor we have already discussed under the changes in eyes. Then muscle enzymes. The myofibrillar protease activity increases linearly and creatinine phosphokinase decreases linearly after death. However, all the biochemical changes are temperature dependent and apply to cold and temperate climates. They have limited practical application. Then here also sometimes it gives a little bit clue about the time since death. For that a sample of hair is shaved from the chin and the length is measured. The rough estimation of time since death can be done from the time since the last shave is known. For beard, the rate of growth is almost 0.4 millimeters per day and the nails it is 0.1 millimeter per day. However, the exact time of death cannot be fixed by any method but only an approximate range of time of death can be given because there are considerable biological variations in the individual cases. Then coming on to the early changes after death and the first change is the post-mortem cooling of the body or the Elgar Martis. During life, a constant balance is maintained between heat production and heat loss. After death, heat production is lost and therefore the body starts cooling. The post-mortem heat loss is mainly by conduction, convection and radiation. The measurement of the rate of cooling helps in estimating the time since death. When the rate of cooling is plotted on a graph, the pattern of the curve assumes sigmoid shape. The body surface starts losing heat rapidly, but the core body temperature does not alter until a gradient is established 
between the core body temperature and the surface. As there is no significant change in the core body temperature for some time, which may be up to 2 to 3 hours after death, an initial plateau is seen. Once the gradient is established between the core body temperature and the surface, the rate of cooling is approximately proportional to the difference in temperature between the body and the surface. The linear rate of cooling is between 0.4 to 0.6 degrees centigrade per hour for the next 12 to 16 hours. Then it gradually becomes slower when the temperature is within 4 degrees centigrade of the environment, rate of cooling is very slow. This is in accordance with the Newton's law of cooling which means after initial plateau the curve dips progressively before it becomes nearly flat at the bottom. The preferred site for measuring the inner core temperature of the body is either rectum or the abdominal cavity, not like the oral cavity in a living human being. And for this a thermometer is also different, not the mercury therm thermometer, it's basically a chemical thermometer with graduations from 0 degrees to 50 degrees Celsius and this is introduced deep inside the rectum up to a, a length of around 10 centimeters. Alternatively, the thermometer can also be kept in the contact with the undersurface of the liver through a slit made in the anterior wall in the right hypochondrium region. At the same time, the environmental temperature is also measured. After taking two readings, the time since death is then calculated by following formula. The normal body temperature minus rectal body temperature divided by rate of fall of temperature per hour that is 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 degree centigrade and this gives a rough idea about the time since death. However, there are following variables which must be kept in mind when we are calculating the time since death with the help of Elgar Martis. The body temperature at the time of death is presumed to be normal. In the contrary, if suppose the person is was having a, a high grade fever then of course this is likely to change or alternatively the temperature itself may rise after death which is called as post-mortem calorisity and this may be seen in the bodies which at the time of death had suffered violent muscular contractions. Then the violent asphyxial deaths such as strangulation there will be this phenomena, septicemic deaths, strychnine poisoning, pontine hemorrhage. So in all these conditions, there occurs post-mortem calorisity, so we have to read it cautiously. Then if the environmental temperature is extremely cold, the whole process of cooling is hastened, while in hot climates, the process may get delayed or the body may not get cold at all as usually happens in our Indian circumstances. Obesity lessens the heat loss as fat is a bad conductor of heat. Then the ratio between the body surface area and the body mass shows that children and old pupil cool more rapidly. The rate of cooling is slower when the body is cloths as cloths are also the bad conductors of heat. The medical legal importance of the Elgar Mortis lies in the fact that determination of body temperature is important only in cold and temperate climate where more pupil die indoors. Often they are not practically applicable in warm or tropical climates as well as outdoor deaths. In tropical zones, postmortem temperature fall is minimal and does not help in estimating a reliable time since death. Then the next important phenomena or you can say feature for estimating time since death, the early sign is liver mortis, also called as postmortem lividity or postmortem hypostasis or postmortem staining. Postmortem hypostasis is the bluish purple or purplish red discoloration due to deoxyhemoglobin which appears under the skin in the most superficial layers of the dermis over the dependent parts of the body after death due to capillovenous distension. It is also called liver mortis, postmortem lividity, postmortem staining, cadaveric lividity, surgulations, YBCs. The mechanism of production of postmortem staining, it is caused by stoppage of circulation, the stagnation of blood in the blood vessels and its tendency 
to sink by force of gravity. The blood tends to accumulate in the toneless capillaries and venules of the dependent parts of the body. And these filling of the vessels produce bluish purple color to the adjacent skin. The portion of the body, especially the upper one, which is drained of the blood are pale in color. The intensity of the color depends upon the amount of reduced hemoglobin present in the blood. In cases of large amount of reduced hemoglobin before death, the blood has deep purplish red color. The development, the postmortem lividity begins shortly after death but may not be visible for about half to one hour after death in normal individuals and about one to four hours after death in anemic persons. Dull red patches of 1 to 2 cm diameter appear in 20 to 30 minutes up to 2 hours which deepen, increase in intensity and become confluent in 1 to 4 hours. In very early stages, these patches may be mistaken for bruise and in case of any doubt, a portion of it should be removed for microscopic examination. The areas then enlarge and combine to produce extensive discoloration. This when the develops, if the end of the finger is firmly pressed against the skin and the held and it is held for a second or two, the lividity on that part will disappear and the skin will be pale or white. When the pressure is released, the lividity will reappear. In case of fixation of lividity, no change in the color will be seen. The fixation of postmortem hypostasis or lividity is assumed to be due to following physical factors. Let's understand those. Blood cannot pass out of the capillaries after formation of postmortem hypostasis. The rigor mortis obliterates the big vessels and so blood cannot pass through the vessels to settle in venules and capillaries in a new area. After full development of rigor mortis, venules and capillaries are compressed and almost empty and cannot be easily distended by the resettling blood. The hypostasis becomes fixed when the blood leaks into the surrounding soft tissues due to hemolysis and breakdown of the blood vessels. And this phenomena usually occurs in 6 to 12 hours or more. Shifting of the lividity. If the body is moved within few hours after death, the patches of lividity will disappear and new ones will form on dependent parts which is called as secondary lividity. A lividity of lighter degree remains in the original area due to staining of the tissues by hemolysis. This is called as complete shifting. The whole process may take few minutes up to one hour. Incomplete shifting after turning the body over, lividity appears slightly in the downward facing part. A non-displacement of lividity is due to hemoconcentration by loss of fluid which penetrates the wall of those vessels related to the hydrostatic pressure. Then distribution of postmortem hypostasis. It depends upon the position of the body and the relevant dependent part. In a body lying in a supine position, lividity first appears in the neck and then spreads over the entire back extending up to the flanks and sides of the neck with exception of the parts directly pressed on. For example, occipital scalp, shoulder blades, buttocks, posterior aspect of thighs, calves and heels. If any object or wearing apparel puts pressure and prevents the capillaries from filling up like collar band, waist band, belts, wrinkles in cloths and such areas they remain free from color and are seen as stripes or bands they are called as YBCs. If the body is lying in prone position the lividity appears in the loose connective tissue in front the color is intense and the tardew spots are common. In death due to hanging, lividity is seen on the hands, feet and lower part of the face above the ligature. In drowning, where the body usually floats with the back facing up and the limbs hanging down, the lividity is seen over the limbs, abdomen and the face. If the body has been lying on one side, then the lividity will settle on that side. It should be kept in mind that postmortem lividity disappears with the onset of putrefaction. Postmortem lividity cannot be appreciated in a dark individual. Postmortem lividity also cannot be appreciated in a fair skinned person 
if they have bled profusely or severely anemic. Postmortem levity may not develop if the body is constantly tossed up and turned as in fast flowing rivers. The postmortem levity also occurs in the dependent parts of the internal organs like in posterior portions of the cerebrum and cerebellum, dorsal portions of lungs, posterior portion of stomach, dorsal portion of liver when the body is in supine condition. Then there are several specific color changes in the postmortem levity because of certain specific poisonings. For example, carbon monoxide poisoning. This imparts cherry red color of the postmortem levity instead of normal reddish blue or bluish red hinge tinge. The hydrocyanic acid poisoning, it imparts bright red color. The nitrates, potassium chlorate, potassium bicarbonate, nitrobenzene, acetylide, bromates, and aniline. These agents which basically produce methylobinemia, they give an appearance of chocolate or copper brown color of lividity. Then phosphorus poisoning gives dark brown or yellow color to the postmortem lividity. The H2S poisoning, the hydrogen sulfide poisoning, this imparts bluish green discoloration to the postmortem lividity. Then we need to understand a difference between the postmortem lividity and congestion which also looks like same. If you see the traits, redness, then hypostasis, the redness will be irregular and on the dependent parts. In congestion, it will be uniformly present all over the organs. If we examine the mucous membrane, hypostasis, it will be dull and lustreless, whereas in congestion, the mucous membrane will appear as a normal. In hypostasis, there will be no inflammatory exudates because it's a postmortem phenomena, whereas in congestion, there will be inflammatory exudates because it's an antimortem phenomena. If you see the hollow viscous, there will be the alternate stained and unstained areas according to the position of the dependent part in case of postmortem staining, whereas in congestion, uh, it will be uniformly present all over the organ. The medical legal importance of postmortem staining is it is the surest sign of death. It helps in estimating the time since death, but this may be unreliable due to the variability. It indicates the posture of the body at the time of death. It indicates the shifting of the body after death from one position to the other and the cause of death can be detected sometimes from the color of the postmortem staining. To summarize this module, the estimation of postmortem interval is one of the most important aim of the postmortem examination in solving various aspects of crime and related issues. Immediate signs of death are loss of respiration, circulation and brain activity followed by changes in eyes after death. The early signs of death include cooling of dead body, postmortem staining as well as rigor mortis which occur up to 24 hours after death. The postmortem staining imparts different colorations in various poisonings and also tells about the position of the body.